My guest today is Eldert Grutenboer. Eldert, how are you? Doing well. About yourself? I cannot complain. I'm uh, here in Chicago. It's actually a pretty nice day. Good. That's awesome. <laughs> what do you do, Eldert? Um, so I'm the program manager for Azure Service Bus. And so people often ask me, what does a program manager do? And I always tell them, like, I try to keep our customers happy. Oh, so, how's, that, how's that going so far? Uh, it's going pretty well, I would say. The customers seem to be happy, so yeah. Happy customer, happy elder. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> uh, Azure Service. Uh, what? So, Service Bus is a is a generic term, and Azure Service Bus is our product name for it. In our yes uh, history of naming things, really boring things. <laughs> That's what we can have with. Uh, what What is a Service Bus generically? So, uh, Service Bus in general is basically uh, a way to decouple applications. I would say. So, most of us know the term uh, Enterprise Service Bus. Uh, which basically like, okay, we have all these different applications and we don't want to talk to them to talk directly to each other uh, because then we get the whole spaghetti architecture. So we put an enterprise service bus in between there. And so Azure Service Bus is like a small part of an enterprise service bus, I would say. So an enterprise service bus would contain things like orchestration, uh, some rules, uh, some bus. And so Azure Service Bus is basically that bus part. So it's basically uh, uh, like queues. You put something in uh, from one uh, producer, and then you have a consumer that picks the message up. And then each message is being picked up by one consumer, so you don't have duplication and things like that. I see. And you mentioned queuing. And I've always been curious about the fact that Microsoft Azure has so many different queuing <laughs> services. Uh, yes. Service Bus and uh, uh, storage queues. And I can't even list them all, but there's... But what's uh, first of all? Why do we have so many? Um, so it's basically the whole. Um, if you have hammer, everything looks like a nail thing. Um, so like, there's the many different uh, scenarios that you can do with um, queuing. So like, for example, storage queues is really about simple queuing. Like, I put something in and I, something has to take it out, and that's about all I want to do. So it's really about simple queuing, uh, high throughput, things like that. Then when you start looking at, for example, Azure Service Bus, like we are really about uh, MQ, I would say. So like things like IBM MQ does, uh, typical EMS, like it's really about that advanced enterprise queuing. So we have things like sessions where you can do in-order processing. Uh, you can do things like uh, auto-forwarding, that lettering where we actually will, if a message cannot be processed, we will actually take it out of the queue, put it in that letter queue and to make sure that you can continue. Um, schedule delivery, like things like that, like more advanced queuing. So that's where service bus would come in. And then we also have other uh, messaging uh, services like event ops, for example, which is more about streaming. So it's really about I have a stream of data and I uh, I don't need that advanced match queuing, but I need a stream of data. And then I will probably want to do something like aggregations over that or things like that. So the thing like Kafka, we actually have a Kafka protocol on top of event ops. Um, so where you can actually do that kind of things. And then you also have things like uh, messaging versus eventing, where message, which we do with service bus, is like, OK, I want something done for me. Like I'm having an expectation that something's done. Uh, but then we also have events, where we, for example, have event grids. And events is more about, hey, something happened. Someone might be interested in this, but I don't know who's interested in this. And that's why we have all these different services. Um, and it's really about picking the right service for your scenario. And even by like a lot of our customers use multiple services next to each other. Because uh, for some uh, scenarios, they might have a uh, streaming where they use event hops. And then uh, on another part of that same application or the same scenario, they might be using queuing, message queuing with service bus. Okay. Yeah, so it really depends on the business scenario, the problem you're trying to solve, which one you're using. And I think you opened with the most simple one is Azure Storage Queue. If that's what you want, you just want to drop something on, do some asynchronous exactly. processing, that's it. But if you want some more flexibility, maybe the service Azure Service Bus it sounds like it's the most complex one, but it's also the most flexible. Exactly. Uh, okay, and then there are other things in between for specific scenarios. Tell me, as a developer, how do we use Service Bus? How does that integrate into our applications? Um, yeah, so basically, uh, if you're developing, like we have uh, SDKs for a lot of different languages. So, of course, we have uh, C-sharp.net, but we also support Java. We support Python. We support uh, JavaScript. I think in total, we have uh, seven different uh, languages that we support natively. Um, and then also, like, you can also talk directly via NKP, for example, if you want to use for anything else. Um, but like most of the, our customers will be using the SDKs. Um, so they uh, hook in the SDK. 
And then it's just like we have a sender. So from the sender, they send a message to the queue or topic. So topic is basically a queue on steroids, I would say. So you put a message in and then you can use routing and filtering to have multiple subscriptions. And then on the consumer side, they listen to either that queue or to one of those subscriptions. And so for the developer, it's really easy to hook that in because they don't have to think about all the underlying infrastructure and etc. They just say, hey, I want to use this. Uh, I want to put in a message and I want to have these features enabled. And then it's really easy for them to use it. Now, if they were there on the Java stack, for example, we also have the JMS that we support. So JMS 2.0, we have almost full support for. Um, so also, for, for example, they're coming from Java and we see there's a lot of the customers coming from IBM MQ or Tipco or ActiveMQ, uh, where they basically can just change their uh, connection string, they load in our package, and then they can continue using JMS as they used to, like they don't have to change the code. They can just very easily plug into this. But does it matter what the message is? Are there restrictions on the, the types of uh, data or the formats or the um, size? So we don't have uh, any specific uh, limitation on the type of data. For us, it's just a binary blob, basically. So whatever you put in there, we'll just process it, like we'll just push it through. So we don't uh, touch your content. So we leave the content, content completely alone. Uh, we just look at message headers and things like that. Uh, we do have one restriction, which is message size. So we have different tiers, but so basically on the basic extended tier, uh, we have a message size of 256 kilobytes. And then on the premium tier, we go up to 100 megabytes. Oh, okay. That's a big difference. <laughs> yeah. Also, I would say like once you are starting uh, getting messages of uh, 100 megabytes or over, you probably have to look, take a look at your architecture because you're probably not doing messaging anymore about data transfer. <laughs> oh, right. So maybe a better solution would be to let's let's drop a yes. message that points to where the data is. Exactly. And then let the client system grab that data. Um, I was looking at some of the features of Azure Service Bus, and I was wondering if you could talk, talk a little about them, like uh, transactions or something that's supported in this yeah, product. So yeah, so transactions is something that we support um, like uh, first, like cloud is hard with transactions. Um, for if you look at any cloud provider, transactions are really hard because just because of the distributed way and every, anyone that has worked with distributed systems before know how hard it is to do to, to, uh, transactions over different systems. Yeah. So with Service Bus, what we do, we have uh, transactions, which basically means that you can trans uh, do a transaction between two different queues within your namespace. And that means that uh, you can say, okay, we, have a lot, we see a lot, for example, is we have an incoming queue um, that we have like uh, limited like um, uh, access control on. They're like, okay, we can just receive on this uh, uh, queue. And then they can use forwarding, like uh, auto forwarding or do things in the application, forward to another queue, and that can be done in transaction. And that makes sure that whenever you have a message that needs to go from one queue to another queue, either it will, uh, will be deleted on one queue and it will be in another queue, or the transaction fails, then will be rolled back and will still be in your first queue. So that's what is really important. Uh, and that's like where, where we see most of our transactions happening. Like we don't do trans transactions where you can say, well, I want to incorporate this with the, the database, for example, just because of like the dispute systems, it's very hard to do. Uh, like I would say it's pretty much impossible to do transactions across different, uh, well, at least in the cloud, like across so many different uh, regions or across different data centers, because what is your truth at that moment? So that's why the, that is so hard. Okay, and you touched on another feature earlier about uh, handling bad messages. Talk a little yes. bit about that. Yeah, definitely. So we have what is called uh, death lettering. And so death lettering is for poison messages, as these are called. So poison. Poison message, yeah, a poison message basically means your message cannot be handled. So that might be because the message is malformed, for example. Um, so your receiver might expect a certain uh, schema for, for you, from your message, but you don't adhere to that schema, and so it cannot be processed. Now, what we can do, like by default, we have 10 retries, but you can configure this yourself. But if that same message comes back after uh, those uh, number of retries, we put them in the death letter queue. And the death letter queue is basically just another queue, like for us uh, internally, it's just the same as a normal queue. But the only difference is that this is the letter queue, that, and that the death letter queue, you can then monitor. And if there's message coming in there, you will probably want to have an operator looking at those messages and pretty much see what is going wrong. So it might be that your uh, consuming system is having issues. It might be an inconsistency with your message itself. Uh, and at that point, they can uh, repair the message, like they can resubmit it at that moment, and then re resubmit it and process it again. Well, okay. Yeah, and one of the other challenges I think that a lot of queuing system has is that a lot of the client systems are are not item potent. They can't handle duplicates of the same message. Yes, uh, they don't want to process it twice. What's but the Azure Service Bus has some way of handling that, right? 
Yeah, so what we have is duplicate detection. So what happens uh, if you enable this is basically we will keep a log of the last X minutes uh, to see which messages came in. And so uh, you can use your own identifier for this. So what we normally would see is like something like an order number or some other identification on the message. And if we see that same message coming in twice, we will just delete the second message. Now, what is important here is that we basically have, uh, we can do at most of once delivery. Uh, so we have the two different lock modes at the moment. So we have a lock mode that's called a peak lock. And with peak lock, what you're doing is like you, your consumer takes a lock on the message, starts processing it, and when it's complete, uh, when that's done, they will call a complete call on it. And so that is at least once delivery, because um, uh, if that uh, process for some reason fails, uh, we don't get it complete, but you still complete, uh, you complete it on your side, uh, the message will become available again and you will uh, do it once more, maybe. Mm -hmm. So that's at least once, but you will at least process the message once. We also have an at most once. So we have another lock mode, which is receive and delete, where you receive the message, you delete it from the queue, and then you start processing. And so why this is important? Because we have at least once and at most once. We don't have exactly once per se. You can implement exactly once, but it will require some logic on your client side because we don't know if you process a message, where did you get in the process, et cetera. Um, and actually there are some patterns around this uh, that we describe on our architecture center, how you can do this. But basically what you would need to do is have some kind of log, like similar to what we do with the deep detection on our side. You would also do something similar on your client side where you would keep track, okay, these messages I have already processed. And also you probably want to do something like, okay, I would also want to track the steps in that process. Because a lot of times when you're processing a message, it might have multiple steps. So when you receive that message again, you probably want to say, hey, already completed step one, two, and three. Let's continue at step four. I see. Um, talk a little bit about uh, the configuring service bus. What does it take to set it up um, and care and yep. feeding of it? Yeah, so of course, uh, you can do this to the Azure portal, uh, like you go to the Azure portal, you uh, create a service bus namespace, and the namespace is basically a container where your entities will be stored in. And so the entities can be queues or topics with descriptions, and you cannot do this all from the portal, of course, like you can configure everything. Also, of course, we support ARM templates, BICEP, uh, we have, uh, you can use something like Terraform. Um, but yeah, basically like a lot of our customers do this to the portal where, because then they also have like immediate insights. Uh, so we have logging and metrics and things like that. So we show nice graphs, like how is your uh, latency going? How many messages are you processing? So uh, what we often see is that like uh, when you first start, like you'll create something in the portal, you will probably export a script out of that, uh, just a script for your own source control. And then you would do like infrastructure as code to roll it out. And then you support it from then on for your whole administration, uh, where you want to see like, okay, how long are my messages taking? How many active messages do I have? Uh, do I see any blips in, for example, if you're on premium, uh, you get some dedicated resources. So you want to see how many CPU am I using? How much memory am I using? Uh, so that you know, like, hey, I might have to scale up at some point or things like that. So that's where you basically go for the whole operations uh, um, and management. Oh, I see. And, and how does the pricing work? What is that based on? Yeah, so uh, like I said, we have three different uh, SKUs. So we have the basic SKU. Uh, the basic SKU I won't spend too much time on is like really our, not even developer SKU. Uh, it just has uh, queues, so we don't see that used that often. Um, it's priced per uh, per million messages, same as standard, which is one that we're, where we see a lot of our customers is on standard. Um, it's also priced per million messages, so you pay uh, X amount of cents per million messages. Mm -hmm. And so this is really nice if you have like burst loads, uh, if you're doing like completely serverless, where uh, you want to be able to basically scale up and down independently on some days I might have uh, 10 million messages, other days I might have 10 messages, um, and you only pay for those messages. Then for the premium SKU, which is our like uh, enterprise grade SKU, I would say like this, where it's all the really nice features like GODR and things like that. Um, so that's uh, per price per hour. So with the premium SKU, basically you get a set of reserved resources. So on standard and basic, like you have shared infrastructure. On uh, premium, you get your own dedicated resources. So you get the amount of CPU, amount of memory, etc., and then you pay that per hour. And so there it actually is about, uh, we don't give any limitation on how much message you can put through. Um, there's of course like some limitation on just how much CPU and memory you have, so how much you can handle. But we don't put any hard limitations uh, converse to like the standard, where you have like 2000 credits per minute. On premium, it's just like, as long as you don't max out your CPU and memory, you can continue adding messages. And that you can always scale up to a larger yes. machine. 
Okay. Yeah, exactly. So it works with meshing units. And so one meshing unit is a certain amount of CPU and memory. And then you can uh, scale those mesh units up. So we allow up to 16 meshing units, so one six, 16 meshing units per uh, nation, uh, per uh, uh, partition. And we just uh, recently released a new feature where we actually allow you to do multiple partitions on premium as well. So at the moment, it's not public preview. At the moment, you can go up to four partitions, which means you can go up to 64 message units. Um, and once this go, goes into GA, we actually will allow that to be even bigger. So you can, uh, for example, if you would have 16 message units with 16 uh, partitions, you could go up to 256 message units. Oh, cool. We're talking about next features. Tell, tell me what's coming yes. down the pike in this product. Yes. So yeah, like I said, we just released the uh, scaling partitions, which I was just talking about. But what's coming up is actually quite interesting. So at the moment, like I just mentioned, GeoDR. And at the moment, our GeoDR is just metadata. DR. That's de disaster recovery, Geo disaster recovery. Yes, exactly. And so at the moment, we just do that for metadata. So basically, your entities, like your queues, your topics, that uh, like your infrastructure, I would say, um, is being replicated, but not your messages. And this is something that is definitely something that a lot of, a lot of our customers are missing because they also want to replicate those messages to another region. And that's something that we are going into private preview very soon. Um, so what we are going to do is basically allow our customers to uh, duplicate their entire uh, namespace, uh, their entire namespace. So that includes all the metadata, of course, but also all the data. Um, and then also all the other configuration of the namespace. And what is nice about this is we are going to allow two different synchronization modes. So we have synchronous replication, which basically says, OK, if you want to have RPO0, like you can have not have any message loss, you can do the synchronous replication. And what that will do is if you submit commit to the primary, uh, we are going to commit to the primary. We are going to commit to the secondary. And then once both of them have uh, said OK, so we wait for the secondary to also come back. And once that is done, we will give the acknowledgement back to the uh, producer. So at that moment, producer knows, okay, it's in two regions now. So if even if one region goes down, it will still be in the other region. And I can just fail over and it will be there. Now, of course, this does introduce some latency because okay. we are uh, committing to a different region. Um, I tried to put in an uh, RFC for the breaking the speed of light, which I'm apparently not allowed <laughs> to do. So yeah, we have to actually like, we have that commitment in the different region. So we have to commit, send it over there, wait for the commit, wait for the answer to come back. And only then we know it's committed. Now, like I said, this adds some latency, and especially if you go on further, like we have some customers that want to do GODR, for example, in Australia and in Europe, like that will add a lot of latency if you have to wait for that. So if you don't want to have that extra latency, then you can actually use asynchronous replication. And with asynchronous replication, basically what we will do is you allow a set a certain amount of RPO. So you might say my RPO is 10 minutes. Um, so that means that you can lose up to 10 minutes of messages. Um, and then when we do it like the same process again, like you commit to the primary, we commit it there. Once committed on primary, we get back to acknowledgement. And meanwhile, in the background, we'll say we replicate to the secondary. Now, at some point, we might see, hey, your late, the, your replication lag is going too high, like your replication lag is now hitting that 10 minutes. At that point, we will uh, basically throttle you saying, hey, you cannot send in uh, more messages now because otherwise you would lose more messages than you're allowed to. That's cool. That's that's something that's coming. What, do you have a timeline yeah. for that? Um, so not specific timeline like that. Like in the coming weeks, we are going to private preview, and then of course it all depends on how long is this private preview going to take. Um, like of course we hope that this private preview will not uh, like we won't hit any snacks, but like we all in our develop like developers ourselves, like we know like sometimes things just go wrong. Uh, things are not quite working as you want, or you might find out hey like what we thought of here is nice, but our customers actually come back with feedback like hey, if you do this and this, it will be even better. So that's always like uh, that uh, play like okay we want to bring this out as fast as possible, but we also want to make sure what we bring out is sort of like fully uh, used to in production. So we'll do the private preview first now, then hopefully soon we can go into a public preview and then at some point into GA. Okay. Yeah. And even though, even though you didn't give any timelines there, I'll point out that we're recording this in March of 2023. Yeah. I'm not sure when I'm going to publish it. <laughs> uh, this is a lot of really good information. What is there anything we haven't talked about that we should have? Um, so there's one more feature I want to highlight that's coming yes, as please. well. So that's also coming into public uh, private preview soon as well, uh, which is durable terminus. And so Terminus is an AMQP term. So Service Bus uses AMQP as their main uh, protocol. You can also use HTTP, but like we advise you to use AMQP. And the Terminus in AMQP is basically the endpoint on either your service or your client. And so between these two terminuses, like you will have a link, which is basically your connection. 
Now, what we see at the moment was uh, because we are working a lot with containers these days, uh, we have distributed uh, systems, um, is that these connections can sometimes break. That might be because your uh, connectivity just broke. It might be because uh, your client had some issue. It might be because we are doing upgrades on your underlying infrastructure, which also breaks the connection because we will move you over to another cluster. And at the moment, whenever your connection breaks, you also lose your message state. So if you have a message lock, for example, like I talked about the peak lock, if you have mesh lock, you would lose your lock and that message would become available again for the next consumer. Now, often you don't want this because uh, you don't want uh, the message to be processed twice. So with the durable terminals, what we are basically doing is inducing a concept where we will have a new lock mode. So durable lock uh, is what we are currently thinking of. It might still change during prior preview, but that's what we have named it for now. And with durable lock, basically what you say is, well, I don't want to, uh, I basically want to have this lock as long as my client is alive. So the client will take a durable lock and then whenever your connection breaks, you can now client can just come back to the surface saying, hey, I'm back again. Please give me my uh, my uh, mesh state back and we will keep the mesh state on the surface. So we'll just say, hey, this is your mesh state. You had this, this lock. Um, here's your message again and you can just continue processing on this. And so that will help a lot of our customers that now are seeing, especially like during upgrades or when something fails, uh, that are now seeing duplications. We will pre prevent this. And so this is also something that we are very excited about. Uh, so we actually, one of the, I think we're actually the first uh, queuing provider or message broker that actually provides this durable terminus. It's part of the AMQP spec, but uh, we don't uh, see it implemented that, uh, at the moment. Mm -hmm. So we will want to be like, okay, this actually brings a lot of value to our customers. So this is also going to preview soon. So same concept like going to preview soon and hopefully uh, we can release this out in the public soon as well. Excellent. Uh, where can people go to learn more about Azure Service Bus? Um, yeah, so definitely, like, uh, of course, go to the documentation, uh, look, uh, search for Azure Service Bus documentation. Like, we have a lot of uh, very good documentation around this. Also, a lot of concepts we spoke about today, but also, for example, which uh, message broker should I use? Should I use Service Bus or Event Apps? Like, we have pages on that. How do you, should you make those decisions? Um, also, I would say, like, um, if you're already using Service Bus, there is the Azure Feedback. Um, or Azure IDs, I think it's called these days. Um, so if you are using Service Bus and you have any feedback, please put that feedback in there. So how Azure IDs works is like you can put in an item yourself or you can upvote someone else's item. Hmm. And this really helps us to like gauge how much interest there is in certain features. And me personally, I actually look at that every week. So I go to the list like what's new, what's been upvoted. And this really helps us to actually do our planning as well. So we actually are now just in the planning for the next uh, six months. And so actually looking at the, the features that are coming in and upvotes, et cetera, helps us to see like, okay, this is where, like if something has to 100 upvotes, this is something that might be very important. So we will get to do some investigation, like, okay, what's required for this? How much time will it take? Um, and then we will try to prioritize those features that have a lot of uh, backing on it. This is what I tell people all the time. If they've got a feature that they really want in a product, tell the product team because the product exactly. teams across Microsoft, they want to build things that people are using. They don't want to build things and sit around and do nothing. Exactly. It's much more like, satisfying to build stuff. Like you said in the beginning, that's my, like Lily, that's my job as program manager is to make sure our customers are happy. <laughs> and this is one of the ways that you can make sure that you get your uh, request in so we can see what we should be working on next. Excellent. And I, I met you at uh, CodeMesh conference in yes. Sandusky, Ohio. Are you doing any speaking in the near future? Um, so I will be in uh, Warsaw uh, in a couple of weeks. Russia? Um, yeah. Uh, Warsaw, like uh, Poland. Oh, Warsaw. Sorry. Uh, yeah, Warsaw. Uh, yeah. In the, that's in the one. I call it Warsaw. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Like I'm from the Netherlands. So uh, we, uh, we uh, are used to call it Warsaw, but uh, yeah, got Warsaw it. is how we would put it in English probably. But yeah, so I've got that in a couple of weeks. Um, and then there's uh, some other conferences coming up later in the year. Um, I just got an invite for KCDC. So that's um, also oh, that's a great really conference. Too. Yeah. And then there's uh, some other slide that we, I will probably go to. Um, I think we have integrated in June, for example, where I also be um, so one of the biggest integration conferences. So that's always nice to meet a lot of people that are like completely focused on our products. Um, but yeah, so I will be around for definitely uh, throughout the year in different places. Elder, thank you so much. This has been really educational. Yeah, thank you so much. So this is what I really about, like about our technology, like the community around our technology is so big. 
And, and I really love this community because like I've got a lot of friends in the community. I make a lot of new friends in the community. Whenever I go to a conference or like to a user group, like there's so many people that want to talk about our technologies and want to le learn and share around it. So, and this is a perfect example, like this podcast, like it's a perfect example of how that community comes together. 